We're going to give folks just one more minute to log on, but while we wait, we would love to hear from you in the chat box. Um, we would love to know what is your hometown grocery store called? So uh, feel free to respond and we'll start in just a moment. All right, well, I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third installment of the webinar series, Keeping Groceries Alive, Successful Ownership Transitions for Rural Grocery Stores. My name is Erica Blair, and I'm a program manager with the Rural Grocery Initiative at Kansas State University. So um, we're so glad to have you joining us today. This is really an important topic because when a grocery store has a transition plan, it is much more likely to remain open and continue serving the community. It's a lot harder to reopen a grocery store after it's already closed, and it can be difficult to find someone to take over the business. So we know that making a business transition plan early not only supports food access in communities, but it also helps ensure the financial security of grocers as they approach retirement. So in our webinar last week, we discussed the characteristics of different grocery ownership models. Um, so not just the independent operator or family owned model that we are mostly familiar with, but also innovative models like municipality owned, nonprofits, public private partnerships, um, even school based grocery stores. So it was a really interesting, really great conversation. Um, and if you missed it, or if you want to rewatch the webinar, you can find the recording at ruralgrocery.org under the events tab. So we'll move on to the next slide. And today we are going to be diving into more specifics of business transition planning. So as you're preparing for a transition, you'll want to know things like how long will this take and who should be involved? How do I estimate the value of a store? So we'll be covering these key considerations and a lot more in this webinar. And we are very excited to be joined by Jack Harwell and John Adesi with the Kansas Small Business Development Center uh, who will be walking us through these details today. So before we begin, we want to acknowledge our wonderful team of partners who helped create this series. Each of these organizations has a unique set of expertise and we really couldn't have done it without them. Uh, we would also like to thank our sponsor, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation for making this project possible. And next slide, before we, be uh, before we begin, I have a few quick housekeeping items. So first, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you can find this recording at ruralgrocery.org, located under the events tab. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, um, we have our excellent students, Lauren and Jess, working behind the scenes who will be available to help you out. And finally, we will have time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. So if you have questions during the presentation, we just ask that you use the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, this just makes it easier for us to track your questions and make sure that we didn't miss anything. You can also click the like button um, if somebody has already asked your question and that will push the question up towards the top. So again, for you know, sharing links and comments and ideas, 
feel free to use the chat box, but for specific questions, please use the Q&A box. So with that, we can go ahead and get started. And we will begin with Jack Harwell, an advisor with the Small Business Development Center, who will walk us through preparing your business for transition. So Jack, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Erica. So next slide, please. So first, I'd like to just uh, give you a background on the Kansas Small Business Development Center in case you haven't heard. Uh, we're a government funded agent, uh, organization. The SBA funds us as well as Kansas Department of Commerce and Johnson County Community College. And uh, our mission is to help small businesses and entrepreneurs start and grow their business through counseling, training, and resources. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide. So our agenda today, uh, I'm going to introduce a new resource called the Kansas Center for Business Transition, talk about what is a transition plan. Uh, John's going to talk about how to estimate the value of your business. And then I'll talk about preparing your business for transition and paving the way for success. So next slide. So again, I want to announce a new online resource for transitioning your business. It's called the Kansas Center for Business Transition. And it's a website with a lot of information that can help you uh, plan your exit. Uh, we've got uh, a checklist that you can go through on what to do to plan your exit, some downloadable tools and a lot of other information. And the idea is to help you understand what, what it takes Possibly you do it yourself or uh, resources to, to help you. Uh, next slide. So we, we talked about this uh, in our first webinar, but I uh, just wanted to kind of remind you that a transition plan is what I consider the ultimate plan. It's the ultimate business plan and it's the ultimate financial plan. Next slide. And so combining those two together, we, we come up with a exit plan, which looks at your personal financial situation as well as the business uh, to get the best outcome possible. Uh, next slide. And the process for uh, an exit plan or a transition plan uh, starts with benchmarking your current state. What's the value of your business right now? And of course, you wanna look at that from the buyer's perspective uh, and then the next step would be to visualize your transition. So think ahead into the future. Uh, what's the timing? When do I want to do this? What are my objectives? What does that deal structure look like? And then the third step is all about preparation. So building value if you don't, uh, if the value of your business needs to grow to meet your objectives. Uh, there might be some structural growth required or cultural growth. And then of course, funding may be an issue. So those are kind of the components of your preparation strategy. Next slide. And I, I showed this in the first uh, webinar, but I wanted to kind of remind you, uh, this is uh, what a transition plan, what the components look like. You've got current ownership and future ownership. So you describe that change of ownership, the timing. Uh, you wanna describe the deal structure in pretty good detail. So you talk about the price of the business, the taxes involved, which is, uh, you're probably gonna pay taxes, so you need to make, understand that, and then any funding required. And then again, on the bottom, you wanna have your preparation plan, and those components we talked about. Next slide. So transitions take time. Uh, the average uh, is about three to five years, depending on the business. Uh, usually an exit plan itself takes three to six months to really figure out. The transition itself will take about a year, uh, including all the marketing due diligence, all the documentation and agreements. Post-transition, a lot of times owners are involved after the close. Either they are a minority participant, they might be a consultant helping the new business um, get on its feet, or simply a carry back loan uh, to help fund that transition. transition. The, the area that varies a lot, depending on the business and the owner is the preparation period. And 
you know, of course, I encourage you to leave as much time as you have as you can to that preparation, so you can possibly grow your cash flow to which adds value to the business, structurally build value into your business, and then prepare it for succession. So again, three to five years is the recommended time frame. Of course, if you haven't given yourself enough time, don't worry about it. Uh, wherever you are, it's never too late to plan that transition and get your um, your ducks in a row to execute that transition. Next slide, please. So we've got a quick poll question. We're curious, uh, when do you expect to exit your business? We'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay, so those that do own a business within the next three years, that's good. We've got a little bit of time. We've got one this year, not too late. Let's let's get the plan started though, if you haven't already. And then an undecided. So thanks for the thanks for the answering the poll. Next slide. So when preparing to uh transition your business, one of the first things you wanna do is build a good transition planning team. And as you can see here, uh, one key role that I see is the exit planning advisor. Uh, that could be someone who focuses just on exit planning, or it could be any of your advisors who have experience and knowledge in exit planning. Uh, in addition to that role, you might need a fin financial planner, a CPA, attorney, a banker, there's a possibility of insurance needs, especially, and you know, we'll talk about at the end of this, uh, uh, contingency planning, you might need an insurance broker or a specialist, like a business intermediary or an M&A uh, broker. Uh, those are common terms for that role. If it's a family business, there might need to be some counseling to help the family dynamics, uh, help, help the family deal with those family dynamics or a functional consultant like a, a specialist in operations excellence or some other focused area. Uh, but building a, a really good team, I believe is your, uh, your first step and it's a great step towards uh, your success. Uh, next slide. So I'll drill a little bit into the exit planner role. Uh, one role is to educate you on succession and important considerations. Uh, things that you might not have thought about, uh, they can bring to the table and make sure they're on, on in your consideration set. Uh, they also help the owner develop and document the desired exit plan. It's important that you have a single plan so uh, everybody's singing off that single sheet of music uh, and that's the role of the exit planner. Uh, the other thing they do is help the owner communicate that plan to others on their team. And then you might also have the exit planner continue to advise uh, during the preparation transition phases of, of your succession. So a very, again, a very important role and either it's a standalone role or somebody else uh, takes up that, that responsibility. Next slide. And the other roles, some of the key roles, uh, financial planner, uh, they can recommend the investment strategy and identify what your needs are for your retirement nest egg. A CPA, very important role to understand taxes. Uh, I mentioned you will be paying taxes most likely on a transition as a seller. And so um, you wanna understand what those taxes will be to make sure your target is set appropriately. And then the CPA will also help, help you identify tax savings uh, there are several options. Uh, I won't be able to get into them here, but uh, your CPA should be able to, to give you some options to defer the, the tax to a later date when you might have a lower rate or some other tricks to uh, legal tricks, but they're tricks to uh, help you save your taxes. 
the attorney, uh, of course, will advise and assist you in negotiations and then draw up your legal documents. And you might need a banker to help in the funding plan. And sometimes there's more than one lender and a good banker will help you kind of coordinate that. So we all understand what those uh, different uh, funding sources, how they work together. Next slide, please. So another poll question real quick. I'm uh, just curious uh, if it's appropriate, who is on your uh, transition team at this point? And I guess if you don't have a team, you can just uh, leave it blank. I didn't think about adding that one. <laughs> Okay, I'm not surprised CPA got the, the, the highest number of votes. Uh, that's, that's probably the first. If I had one to choose from, that would probably be my first one. Uh, thank you. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna hand this over to John and he's gonna talk about business valuation. All right. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I, I visited with you all. I was trying to figure that out probably 2018 over in Manhattan. I sure miss seeing people in, in uh, person, but you got to love the fact I was looking at the chat and seeing people from just a huge swath of America. So that's uh, that's terrific. That's one advantage in this dispersed virtual reality that we have right now. But thank you for having us. Uh, Jess, I'll have you go to the next slide, please. Awesome. Thank you. So we're going to look at uh, several different methods. And actually, I'm going to start from the bottom on this thing. Um, and we're going to spend more time on the stuff on the top. I'm going to start on the bottom with asset based. And look, that's just we don't want you doing that. That's just selling, uh, selling the cooler and the shelves and the inventory. And you're going to get the lowest possible value for that. That is a essentially a fire sale. Um, if there is no value to the business in terms of income, that's the way we got to go, you know. Um, but we're not looking at that. Next one up, uh, not today, next one up is comparable sales. Now that's a very informal uh, valuation method. That's kind of when you know that uh, somebody a couple of towns over had a store just a little bit smaller than yours and got 350,000 and you're thinking, well, shoot, my town's bigger, my store's bigger, mine's gotta be worth 400. And that is certainly one way of looking at things, but it's very informal. The other two uh, toward the top, where we look at a fraction of annual revenues or a multiple of, of SDE, and we'll define that, that is still a comparable method, but it's with some science to it. It's looking uh, at some um, thumbnails and some rules of thumb from brokers, from actual sales, and taking a look at that. And I highlighted a couple of words on there because we get people sometimes that think that the value of their business is a multiple of sales revenues and no <laughs> uh you, you 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 better have a gold mine you have something like that it is a fraction of annual sales revenue or a multiple of that sde that seller's discretionary earnings which we'll define i believe on the on the next slide and that's typically kind of low between one and four but we'll talk about that so just why don't we advance so this is the the book definition of sde seller's discretionary earnings um i won't read it to you but what we're looking at basically is um, anything that uh, that went to the owner and then making any kind of changes that we'll talk about if, if there was a one-time charge or um, something in there that uh, that wouldn't accrue to the new owner or wouldn't be an expense for the new owner we kind of make some adjustments and we'll, we'll show you a slide on that uh, why don't we go to the next slide for a far more informal definition there we go because uh, I am the informal member of this crew let me tell you and the informal one is really just what's the net cash benefit to the owner? You know, what's what's the total good, the total cash uh, or uh, or positive benefit that the owner is going to get? So of the three, I wish I'd shoot. We should have done this as a poll question, Jack. I, I, I blew it. Of the three income statements, if we have a cash flow analysis and a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet, where are we going to look for that? And uh, I realize that I'm talking to a crowd that can't talk back. So <laughs> we'll go to the next slide and we'll just find out. There we go. Yeah, absolutely. Of those three uh, income, of those three financial statements, we're going to be looking at the income statement, otherwise known as the PL 
or the profit and loss statement. And so you see in that uh, column here where it says original, uh, we've got sales, 1.4 million, a uh, whole bunch of returns, stuff went bad. Um, cost of goods, of course, is their wholesale cost, 450 out of that, leaving about a million bucks for gross profit. And then you have all the other expenses, primarily wages. And what we're left down at the very bottom of this thing is 100 and a quarter, okay? That is the seller's discretionary earnings. But John, but Jack, there are two columns on this thing. And we have this column where it says add backs. And um, that is, again, that uh, those extraordinary charges or things that wouldn't accrue to the new owner or, 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 uh, or things that the present owner is taking out of the business that we need to basically add to that person's bottom line to figure out what that total net benefit is. So let's, let's advance one. I've got a list. There we go. So, for example... If uh, your store is paying for your health insurance or life insurance or uh, a cell phone, you're putting money into retirement. Sometimes you got a spouse on the books or you got your 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 uh, your wife's dim witted younger brother or something like that on the books just to give them a job. Uh, there might be a vehicle that you use. We don't we generally add in uh, one owner's salary, you know, especially if they're paid above. We add that back in. Uh, that's part of the benefit, obviously, that they're getting. Sometimes it's a situation where rent is being paid to a, another legal um, organization, basically. If you have real estate, sometimes we have the real estate under one LLC or corporation and the store under another. So, you know, we might have to make some changes there. And then if there's any one-time thing, like, for example, in 2020, we saw a bunch of one-time charges for uh, new PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, plexiglass uh, on the stuff, you know, different... Um, different cleaning products that you might have had to buy in 2020. If there's a lawsuit uh, uh, against the store that we sure as heck don't think is going to happen every year, <laughs> we'd add that back in. So let's go ahead. One more slide, Jess. So again, this is the profit and loss, but adjusted for all that. So we've added back in the owner's salary to make sure that that's on that bottom line uh, and payroll taxes on that salary discretionary. Who knows? That's, that might be the dim-witted brother-in-law. Um, equipment loss, uh, you know, anything else, personal phone, personal fuel. Um, again, this might be uh, uh, retirement or something like that. But you get the idea. And that's a significant difference. 125 grand on one side and over 300 on the other. That's a pretty big difference, especially when we're talking about taking a multiple. So let's go to the next slide and we'll take a look at what those multiples might be. So this is one tool that we use. Um, we have it in book form. It's an expensive little bugger. It's hundred and $175, but we subscribe to the online one and they update it uh, very frequently. And we like this. The business reference guide takes in rules of thumb from business brokers. And we can narrow this down, obviously, to your industry. So we're not looking at just all small businesses. And, uh, and we can further narrow uh, down to other constraints as well in terms of areas, whatever. But we see a couple of rules of thumb here. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Here's SDE. Uh, two to three times. Remember, I said you get a multiple of uh, SDE, sellers discretionary earnings. Uh, it's two to three times, and then they're adding in, you know, inventory and equipment and fixtures, FFE, furniture, fixtures, and equipment kind of thing. You get a little bit higher multiple of earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. This, again, um, is the way to look at the valuation as a fraction of your revenues. And so they're talking about 10 to 22% plus inventory, all right? Uh, or, or also comparing EBIT to EBITDA kind of thing. This is where we're gonna live right here, basically, uh, for the most part. We're looking at, again, two to three times SDE, and you can add in the FFE, the uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, or 10 to 22% of annual sales plus the inventory that you have. These are, and again, this is your industry. So let's take a look on the next slide of some actual sales. So we also subscribe uh, to deal stats. Um, and this is cool. I mean, this um, we ran this report just last week. We're, we're reaching all the way back to 1991 and all the way up to the last sale that they had in here was early October of 2020. Um, to, uh, with Jack's uh, input, we narrowed the uh, range a little bit from a low of sales. This is net, net revenues a low of 28 grand up to about 5 million, okay? And so there are, you know, hundreds of sales in here. There's 423 sales in here. Now, a lot of data on this page, but I go right to this one. Again, this is that fraction of revenue. Now, it's higher than what we saw on the other page because this is all in. Remember, the other page was 
10 to 22 percent plus inventory this is all in 28 percent of revenue so it's basically adding uh that in this is a uh the result of actual sales okay and let's see yeah 423 sales go into that and then if we take a look at sde uh fewer sales were based on that about 200 but we saw we see a multiple of four now again remember it was two to three maybe on that business reference guy but that was in addition to furniture, fixtures, and equipment, which is why you're seeing a couple of different numbers. But these are actual sales. And so we're happy to uh, work with you on this, kind of narrow it down to a um, uh, to a revenue range that's very similar to your business to get a, you know, a, a finer degree of accuracy. Next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, Jack put this together, he did a fabulous job. He's got a fillable PDF that we will provide to you um, you can go in there and you can determine what your own seller's discretionary earnings are. And it has lots of notes and instructions to keep you good uh, there and really talk you through that. So that's going to be part of the uh, part of the package here, the follow up. Next slide, please. And then once we have the numbers, we might want to take a look at two or three years and we might weight them uh, now in a, in a normal world. <laughs> Uh, Pre-COVID, we would we would weight the latest year uh, most strongly, but you know sometimes you might do it a little bit differently. We might weight the highest uh, level of 2019 before all this began. Uh, now some grocery stores had banner years, you know, uh, so you when you're setting the price might weight 2020 as the higher year, but cheap John buying the grocery store is going to say, well, yeah, 2020 was an extraordinary year. I'm going to wait that one. And we're going to, you know, the buyers and sellers look at this a different way. But anyway, you can take a look at the, yeah, it's what hap what's happening in the world and actually put a weight to those numbers and then get a, a, a weighted average that uh, really gives you a nice, accurate view. I think I got one more slide or so, please, Jess. Awesome. And now these are thumbnail views. Okay. This is still a very great data. Okay. But very informal way of doing this. Um, if you really want to narrow the right down to the actual number instead of a range of numbers or a, what we call an indication, uh, then you would use a CVA, a certified valuation analyst as someone that's, that's trained, very specialized um, beyond what a CPA would have there. Um, some loans, if you have an SBA back loan and the good goodwill or blue sky is over a quarter of a million dollars, which basically means the price is $250,000 more than the assets. <laughs> so it doesn't take much. Um, they're going to require one and a lawsuit. One might be required in a divorce. Hey, one might be required. Uh, you can spend a grand or so, or you can spend $5,000 on those things. Um, but again, if you were going to list the business or you're going to actually accept an offer or, or make decisions about your life, uh, based on this, you really want the real deal from a CVA. One more slide, please. This is the beginning of a poll. So now that you have learned the a couple of the main numbers, rules of thumb, about how we look at either a fraction of sales or a multiple of SDE, sellers discretionary earnings, one more slide for the actual question, Jess. Is your business worth what you thought? So we'll, let, we'll give you... Give you a little time right there. All right, so 15% uh, said yes, 4% uh, said no. Uh, no, I thought it'd be worth more, so we got, we got a little bit of working room there. And a uh, whole, whole lot of folks need to buy a business, Jack. <laughs> buy or build a business. But hey, that's good news, though. About four times as many people um, nailed it, basically, and had the right idea, so that's good news. Uh, let's see. One more slide. And... At the very beginning, we talked about the fact that the multiples are typically, you know, one to four, all industries, maybe three to four in this industry. If, those of you that play on Wall Street a little bit, you're seeing multiples and it's called a P.E. ratio, price to earnings. It's exactly the same thing, right? We're talking about the price uh, uh, of the of the cash, basically. Now, this is a pretty recent one from NASDAQ, QQQ, and it's about 22. So why is Wall Street getting 22 times cash 
or earnings, and you're only getting two or three or four times cash or earnings. And it really is about risk. You know, on a, on a, a publicly traded company, uh, there's transparency, there are processes in place, there's accounting in place, and and uh, and there's a little, there's per, less perceived risk on that. The more that you can do, and Jack's going to talk about this, the more that you can do to mitigate risk and limit risk for your buyer, which means allowing you to be taken out of there, for example, uh, so they don't need you and your knowledge and your personality. It is embedded in processes or procedures or whatever. Um, the, the new owner can come in. The vendors are still in place. The, um, the community is still in place. You don't have to worry about a new competitor moving in right away or so. The more you can do to mitigate risk, the further we can move from that small business sale multiple to what we call a strategic sale kind of multiple where it might be five or, or eight or 10 times where someone wants to buy your territory and they want to expand. And, and if you have everything in place so that they can just come on in and, and snap that up and run it beautifully, you're going to move that move the needle on that. Is it easy? No, but it's, it sure is worthwhile. So, Jack, I think I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right, John, thanks. So now we'll talk a little bit about preparing your business for transition. Next slide. So we, we asked you uh, if you knew your number, or we asked you if you knew the value of your business. And so the next question is, what is your number? Uh, and this, you know, of course, is kind of focused on uh, business owners that are going to retire or, or use that money for retirement when they transition their business. Uh, but as you see on the left-hand side, you've got some needs to retire, you know, the income you need, any inheritance you want to give out or gifts, and then uh, any kind of a safety buffer you might need uh, to cover those unknowns. And then you stack that up against what you already have, your savings or 401k, your pensions, annuities, life insurance, other uh, assets. And then what's left or what needs to fill the gap is the business value. And so um, knowing your number is important and that's part of that uh, exit planning, transition planning process. Uh, but one reminder, whenever you're thinking about what you need, uh, as far as the value of your business, you also have to think about the taxes. Uh, I've said that a couple times, taxes will probably be levied and that may be as, as much as 30, 35%. So um, make sure you allow for that. Next slide. So, uh, one more question. Do you know your number? Do you know what you need from the business to retire? All right, so four of you think that you can get there with your business. Um, four of you need to grow the value, or three of you, I'm sorry. So that's that's not unusual. And then there's some that don't know the value of the business. So um, hopefully this webinar will help you. And of course, you know, there, there are resources to help you uh, beyond the webinar. Uh, next slide, please. So there's generally two ways to increase the value of your business. And one is to increase your cash flows. And the other is to increase the multiples that John talked about. So next slide. To increase your value, uh, because market valuation is based on the cash flow, then obviously that's one lever you can use to increase the value. And uh, some pretty basic ways, I'm sure you probably thought through this, more revenue, will increase your cash flow, obviously. Uh, and you can get that by more sales or just changing your pricing, which you may or may not be able to do. And then uh, the other uh, way you can increase your cash flow is lower your cost. Your cost of goods sold, so what you pay for the product that you put on your shelves, uh, the overhead, uh, and any capital expenses that go along with it. So um, those are some general ways to improve your cash flow. And, and it, I'm sure you know it's not an easy task. And that's one reason that we recommend 
a three to five year transition time is to to be able to work on increasing your cash flow. Next slide. And then the other uh, control that you have over the value of your business is the multiple. And as John mentioned, uh, the way that you increase your multiple is really reducing risk that the, the, the buyer's perception of risk that they see in your business. Next slide. And there's, there's a lot of ways to increase value and to improve your multiples, but uh, there's three key drivers of, of that. One is how much the owner is involved in the business. If you think about it, if you're a buyer and you see a business and you're thinking about buying it, but the business can't operate without that owner, how much value does that business really have? Now, you know, there's a saying in the broker world that that a business that can't run without the owner uh, has no value. So uh, keep that in mind. The other uh, way to do it, it, to increase value is to establish sustainable and predictable business processes and then general business risk uh, reduction would be the third. So we'll get a little bit more detail with this. Uh, next slide. When you're thinking about owner involvement, uh, think about your business operations as five layers or five levels. Uh, you've got your backroom operations, which is your basic day-to-day, -day, you know, clean the, clean the floors, wipe the counters, all that activity that's just necessary to operate your business, pay the bills, all of those uh, kind of backroom operations that the customer usually doesn't see. The second level is your product or service delivery, and that's all the things it takes to deliver your product or service to your customer. Uh, the, the person at the checkout stand or putting product on the shelf for the convenience of the customer. The third layer is customer acquisition, and that's the process of marketing and sales and attracting customers and keeping customers. And the fourth level up is your relationships. And those relationships go beyond just your customers. That's an important relationship, but you also have employees, and vendors, and community, uh, your community. All of these relationships need to be managed. And at the top level is strategy. Make setting the strategic direction of, the, of your business. And if you think about it for a minute, uh, the, the higher that you go up the uh, pyramid, the more value that you can bring to the business as an owner. Uh, the more time you spend on strategy and relationships and the less time you spend on backroom operations and product service delivery will make your business more valuable while you have it and will make it more valuable when you sell it. And the other kind of interesting thing about this is if you look on the left-hand side, I've got an arrow pointing down uh, because the, the lower you go on the pyramid, the easier it is to train somebody else to do that task. And so it's easier and quicker to get rid of those bottom layers of activity off of your plate and put it on somebody else's plate. Uh, so this, this it doesn't have all the answers, but hopefully it gives you some thought around a strategy or how are you going to move yourself up the pyramid. Next slide. I mentioned sustainable and predictable business processes. Uh, what that means is Again, your business can run without you. It can acquire customers, deliver product, do all those things that customers expect. And you do that with documented procedures, not a thick book that goes on a shelf that nobody ever looks at, but documented procedures that are in the face of the people that are doing the process. Uh, so little visuals, a lot of graphics, very few words. Uh, but the, the main point is everybody knows the right way to do things and everybody does things the right way. Process compliance is that doing things the right way. So making sure that now that you have procedures documented, everybody follows those procedures. And then third step would be to have systems in place. And I'm talking computer systems, software, whether it's on your computer in the cloud, but those systems support your processes. Uh, your POS is, is uh, your point of sale uh, system. Uh, customer relations systems, things like that. Uh, so that's uh, some high level 
uh, ways to uh, increase the multiple in your business. Uh, next slide. And then reduction of risks. Uh, the risk could be diversification of customers and suppliers. That may not apply as much in the uh, grocery world as some other industries. Uh, safe work environment. Uh, if a buyer comes in and looks at your business and they see a lot of safety issues, and if they're smart, they're going to shy away and they might discount the price they want to offer because they're going to already wheels are turning their head. They're going to need to do some improvements to make it an environment that they want to work in. And then any economic risks. Of course, COVID was a, a big hit for a lot of us, and it did impact uh, the, the uh, business uh, market, the market for selling businesses, it was impacted by the risk of COVID and the actual impact on the economy. Um, and then are there any regulatory risks in your business? Um, I don't think in most cases that's going to be an issue for grocers, but there might be a special situation there. Next slide. One thing we'd like to offer, uh, it's called a value opportunity profile. And uh, that's where you can go online. It's a free tool that we support at the, KS, at the SBDC. And you can enter your financial information and answer 97 questions. I know it's a lot, but it's really getting into the details. And it'll give you a, a report that provides you a risk score, the estimate of value from their perspective, and then gives you a, it's a pretty robust report of opportunities to improve your business. And the SBDC at Johnson County Community College will offer that to you for free. All you need to do is go to this link and we'll make that available to you after the webinar. Just go in, set yourself up, input the information. We'll get a notification that you've done that and we'll be in contact to, uh, to uh, help you understand the results. And there's no cost of either doing the profile or getting assistance in understanding the results. So I uh, highly encourage you to check it out. Next slide. So finally, paving the way for success. Next slide. I mentioned it earlier, structural growth and cultural growth. Those are two areas that uh, I think you should put some serious thought to, especially if you're contemplating uh, a transition to a business structure that we that Erica mentioned in the beginning, a co-op or or community owned or some other uh, sort of a collaborative uh, ownership model. Um, these two components of growth are very important. Next slide. So what I mean by structural growth is you might need to change the organization, add some management structure, supervision, uh, things like that. You might need a board of directors. A lot of the uh, collaborative ownership models or employee ownership models that uh, succeed are the ones that have a good, strong board of directors. Family transitions, I think, should uh, benefit greatly from a board of directors. Uh, management team and in management communications. So what I mean by communications is uh, clarity and transparency on what's happening in the business. It may be awkward for a lot of business owners who have kind of run the shop themselves and kept everything close to the vest. But if you move into a more collaborative management structure, or collaborative ownership structure, that communications is going to have to change. Next slide. So I've got this um, concept of what might be a good strategy for transitioning your business to one of these um, collaborative or employee ownership models. Uh, and if you think about that line in the middle, that vertical line T is the date of your transition. Well before that transition, you, you might wanna start thinking about who's gonna be your successor and hire them or uh, designate who that is, uh, depending on the circumstances. If you have somebody in house that's capable and, and you've identified them as managing the business going forward, you want to get them started down that path and start training them so they can uh, pick up the reins. And also help you as you move up the 
pyramid, by the way, and add more value to your business. And somewhere along the line, you want to establish a board of directors. And then um, what I depict on the bottom here is showing that the owner's share of the business goes down over time as a percentage of the business as the successor shares go up. And this model won't work for everybody, every circumstance, uh, but maybe some variant variation of this model, uh, but be happy to talk to anybody about how it might work in their business. Next slide. And then if you're thinking about a cooperative governance structure or a co-op co or a community owned or some other um, business model that we've been talking about, uh, it might help you to understand how the governance structure works. Or if you do install a board of directors, this is generally how it would work. You've got the worker owners on the bottom and in a co-op situation, they would put a small buy-in to buy the business, but typically that's not all the money that's required. And going uh, clockwise from that bottom worker owners um, icon, the worker owners elect the board of directors, and then the board appoints the general manager or the president, and then the general manager runs the business operations. So the employees report to the general manager and the general manager directs the business just like the owner did before. And the board also is responsible for developing the corporate bylaws, which establish the business structure and some of the high level procedures and policies. And then all of the profits in this scenario, a co-op scenario, all the profits go to the capital accounts. And, and on the right hand side, I kind of show a capital stack that might be, uh, of course, every situation would be different, but you might see in a co-op, you got your worker, workers, uh, worker owners uh, capital account where they put money in, but it's not enough to transition the business. Maybe you got some community investment, maybe a seller's note. So the seller carries back some of the uh, price in, in a loan, and then maybe a banker's note on top of all that. So again, that's just an illustration, a general example uh, but just wanted to kind of give you some thoughts around that. Next slide. And when we talk about cultural growth, uh, we're talking about transparency, open books. You, you know, not every line item should be known by every person. Certainly don't want people knowing other people's salaries, but a lot more information about how the health, financial health of the business uh, needs to be available when you have multiple owners. Uh, decision making needs to be clear, understand how those decisions are being made. And then um, transparency uh, in terms of what the employee's involvement is in the financials. And when I mean what I mean by collaborative uh, in terms of culture is where problems are solved collaboratively. It's not a command structure where the boss says do this and we do it. It's more of let's work together to figure this problem out. And again, collaborative decision-making. And then probably the most important is your, your business needs to be, your culture needs to be fact-based. Looking at data without passion, without bias, just facts, that's the way it is. And what do we do with that information? Your business should be data-driven. So you analyze the results of the, performance and then you make corrections using that data to help you understand what's going on and what what's possible. And that's done through KPIs and performance management structures. Uh, and then one other note uh, with cultural growth that there's going to need to be training and mentoring for most likely both sides of the equation, the management team as well as the employees in order to make this thing work. Uh, next slide. So uh, that's that's what we uh, wanted to share with you today in terms of, uh, you know, the, the preparation, preparing your business for transition, kind of an idea of what your business might be worth, and then some ideas of what the transition plan might look like and how long it takes. So with that, uh, we're ready to answer any questions. 
All right, thank you so much, Jack and John. That was a really great presentation. We covered so much ground in just a short amount of time. Um, thanks for so much information. If folks have questions, uh, feel free to post them in the Q&A box. We have about 10 minutes to answer some questions. So we have one question here for you. Um, the first question is, do you recommend hiring a business consultant to help sell your business? And do you think they're worth the cost? And I was also wondering if, if either of you have any estimates on how much they might cost as well. Sure. Uh, well, you know, of course, probably every answer I give starts with it depends and it depends on the business. Uh, but in general, uh, a business consultant is it, how much you need help depends on your circumstance and how much you want to commit your own time and resources and energy into learning. Uh, because if you choose not to hire someone to help you, then you might have to, to learn a lot to be able to help yourself well. Uh, brokers, uh, business brokers are a good resource for uh, someone who can help you prepare your business and sell it. Of course, they want a piece of the action. I don't know, John, I'm thinking maybe 10% or something. Yeah, I see, I see 10 and 11 really commonly. So... You know, again, is it worth it? Well, of course, number one, to understand what 10% means, you have to understand what your business might be worth to figure the math on that. But uh, once you've done that, then it's a question of, do you want to spend that money or do you want to do it yourself? I mean, that, that is a question. And really it's my mind, do you want to learn how to do it, to do it well, or do you want to pay somebody to do it while you focus on building the value of your business? And you know, there's also the question of risk. Uh, if you haven't thoroughly studied, and by the way, no matter how much you study, you may not have the experience necessary um, to to do a good job or to anticipate those unknowns that you would have never thought about. Um, so what's that worth to you? And what are the costs if something bites you? Uh, I, I, I hesitate to put a plug, but, you know, it's, it's hard not to... to, to to announce that the SBDC in Kansas can help you. Uh, so uh, we've got uh, regional offices all around the state. We do what we do, paid by your tax dollars. So mm -hmm. we're prepaid and uh, confidential. So uh, that's that's one way to get help. Thank you. Um, now, in the early on in the presentation, you discussed how much time a transition will typically take. So I'm wondering, is it ever too early to start thinking about a transition plan? Not at all. In fact, you should think about it before you start a business so you know what the end game is. You know, there's a lot of quotes that I could give you about planning and results. And if, if the transition plan is the ultimate plan for your business and your financials, why wouldn't you start it the day you think about starting your business? That's, that's my thought. John, you got any other thoughts about that? Oh, you know me, I always have other thoughts, Jack. <laughs> can't, can't keep me down. You know, none of the processes that are shown in the value opportunity profile, for example, are going to hurt you. Uh, remember that the sale price uh, that you're going to get when you exit is based on the cash that you're, that you're able to tap from the business. So even if you're looking at 20 years from now, good Lord, why don't we make more money in those two decades and, and, uh, and really get the business firing on all, on all cylinders. And, uh, oh my gosh, we've, we've just seen so many times where somebody just needs a business, just needs a checkup. Um, and, and a few things tweaked. I was working with one recently where it was just a gross profit margin problem. And, um, just, uh, uh, right down to some pricing issues that had to be addressed. They hadn't changed prices in 12 years. You know, and, and uh, so their, their gross profit margin was just down, 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 and to the point where they didn't have any net profit. Yeah. And, and you know, another thought that I had was um, if, you, if you set the goal when you start, I would recommend every year, or even if you don't have a goal, every year kind of do a touch base on the value of your business. In fact, I would recommend you rearrange your financials 
So the SDE is calculated for you and it's quick and easy. Look at your, your bottom line SDE, know your multiple, maybe tweak it a little bit as you get better. And then if you do that every year, you'll, you'll more likely stay on path. Great. Well, we had another question come in here from Debbie. She says the, the SBDC in Emporia was very helpful in getting an appraisal of the grocery business. Um, are all of the SBDCs in Kansas equipped to do grocery appraisals? Well, uh, what I will say is there's five certified exit planning advisors in the state that, that are certainly capable. John's capable. There's a lot of advisors that are not certified but are capable. I'm not, I don't really have an assessment of everybody, but I could say that the, regardless of where you are in Kansas, if your local SBDC can't help you, they know who can and they will reach out. We feel it's our responsibility. If we can't help a client, we're going to find somebody that can. Yeah, we, we tap the we tap the, the network statewide because yeah. we all have areas of expertise. There are people doing tech commercialization, people doing international trade, people doing valuation. So uh, we can we can we can get the right expertise to the right person. Yeah. And by the way, we also have three certified valuation analysts if you get to that point where you really need to put some money behind it and figure it out. One of them's in Emporia, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah at least so. <laughs> I'm guessing that's who helped, Debbie. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. So, um, so here's another question that's sort of related to <laughs> what I asked earlier about, you know, how much, when should you start? planning. So, so is it ever too late to start planning a transition? So for instance, what would you say if a grocer called you and said that they wanted to close the store next month? What would, what would you tell them? Well, I certainly wouldn't send them away. I mean, they, they need help regardless of where they are in the process. Uh, I will tell them that there's not a lot we can do, but maybe do a little, uh, what I call uh, curb appeal work on the curb appeal, you know, paint the front door, clean up the back room, just some of that basic. Uh, when you're selling your business, when we talked about it, but just to emphasize, it's all about risk, what the buyer sees as a risk. And if I'm buying your business, I walk into the back room and it's a mess. Well, there, your risk factor just went up quite a bit because now I know you're not efficient and your employees don't follow direction uh, unless that's your direction and then they need to be retrained. Um, so it's never too late, but um, don't have high expectations if you don't have much time, I guess would be what I would say. Yeah, you're sure not going to have time to move the needle if the uh, bottom line, you know, sometimes we, this happens very frequently. Someone goes to their accountant, their accountant wants to make you happy. They figure that the way to make you happy is to reduce your bottom line so you pay fewer taxes, right? But then you want to sell the business and it's based on a multiple of that bottom line. You're like, well, wait a minute. I made more than 15 grand. Well, yeah, but that's what we've been showing the government, you know, and yes, we can do it with some ad backs and stuff, but you're not going to move the needle on that kind of stuff very easily. Great. Well, thank you both so much. This has been such an informative webinar. I'm so glad that you were able to join us and answer these questions. Um, so we're going to have to wrap up now. Um, but I wanted to also mention that, you know, there were a lot of wonderful resources that were provided throughout the webinar. So um, we will be posting several handouts, several resources to our website at ruralgrocery.org under the events tab. Uh, so you can check back there for those handouts. So in the last minute here, we just wanted to remind you that our full webinar schedule is posted on our website. We have a lot of great topics still coming up. So you can um, see the schedule in the description, descriptions of all the webinars at ruralgrocery.org. Um, and also next week, uh, we will be talking about assessing markets and community needs. So ownership transitions present an opportunity for the grocery store to adapt to community needs. So you might wanna think about, are there new services that should be offered does the building need any upgrades? Should you be partnering with another business in town? 
So this webinar next week will be discussing various ways of assessing an, an existing grocery store and how you can involve the community to facilitate a business transition. So with that, uh, we wanna thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you have a, a better understanding now of how to prepare for business transitions. And we hope to see you all next week. Thanks.